Thank you everyone for joining us. My name is Matthew Fold, the director of Photon Counting CT from Siemens Health and Ears. It's my pleasure to have you here today for a great webinar, Photon Counting CT for Pediatric Cardiovascular Imaging, Real World Applications. I'll be joined today by two fabulous pediatric cardiologists from Children's Minnesota who will show you what they've learned since they've gotten the system installed. Uh, to get us started, I will give a brief introduction. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat and we will try to address them as the webinar is going on or at the end. At Siemens, we believe the driver for cardiac CT is temporal resolution. It's a mantra that we've lived since the beginning of cardiac CT. When we were in the realm of 250 milliseconds, today with dual source CT, we can achieve 66 milliseconds on our high-end systems. We do this by having not one x-ray tube that requires 180 degrees in order to capture an image, but having two x-ray tubes and two detectors rotating only one quarter. This allows us to have twice the speed of a conventional system, allowing us to have temporal resolution as fast as 66 milliseconds. This also enables not only fast temporal resolution, but fast volumetric imaging, which allows us to do single beat cardiac acquisition, single beat no breath hold imaging, vascular planning, et cetera. This is the way that you can do the fastest acquisition on the market to give the best quality of care for your cardiovascular patients. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention that we are about to introduce a brand new dual source CT, the newest member of our traditional energy integrating portfolio, our Somatome family, uh, will be launched November 16th. At noon Eastern time, please follow the QR code link here to sign up for this event to learn about the newest traditional dual source CT. If we think about CT in general, go up to the, say, the 30,000 foot view. Why CT? We do CT because we have detailed information about anatomical structure. We just talked about temporal resolution and the ability to stop motion, and that's critical for many organs such as the heart, lungs, bowel, et cetera. And if you've had a scanner change in, say, the last 10, 15 years, you've probably looked beyond simple morphometry and started looking at composition and function with spectral imaging. The challenge is that these three things individually are great, and in the past there had been no way to do them all simultaneously while achieving low radiation doses. Photon counting CT is the enabler to bring all of these things together in one single solution. How is that possible? A conventional energy integrating detector is based on a two-step conversion. X-rays hit a ceramic material and create light. That light is turned into an electrical current. But we have to design a detector with light in mind. So there are these dark gray walls to block the light and keep them within an individual element that reduces our radiation dose efficiency. It also limits the size of the detector elements that we can create. In addition, all of the X-ray information from multiple X-ray photons is averaged together. And so if we wanna look at the individual energy, we have to come up with specialized solutions to look at spectral characteristics. Photon counting is different, no longer a ceramic, now a semiconductor. When an X-ray photon hits, it deposits an electrical charge that is proportional to its energy. And so we can directly measure the energy of each incident X-ray that hits the detector. This means we have direct conversion. So X-rays directly to electrical current, it means we can actually measure every individual X-ray. We can count them. That's why it's called photon counting. But one of the main benefits of this technology is that it enables us to go much, much higher resolution by using much, much smaller detector elements. What we call quantum HD or quantum HD cardiac is our ability to do ultra high resolution imaging and is 
very important in cardiac CT. So not having a scanner with a conventional energy integrating system that may be able to do spectral imaging, but typically not in cardiovascular to a photon counting CT that has smaller detector pixels with higher resolution can completely eliminate electronic noise, spectral sensitivity for separation of iodine, calcium and other materials, and just innately better iodine contrast because of how the technology works. We've introduced this photon counting technology, what we call quantum technology, it's seen in health and ears, as a dual source CT. So taking advantage of that temporal resolution, volumetric speed, this is the Naatom Alpha, the world's first photon counting CT. We are already in year three with more than 450,000 patients already scanned worldwide. We are quite happy and proud of this technology and the impact that it's having on patients. We know in cardiovascular that it allows us to visualize fine uh, coronary details, look at stents, plaques, and do it without motion artifacts. We can separate iodine and calcium that allows us to look at challenging cases that we would typically not do and may send to another imaging modality like the cath lab. And we can do spectral imaging even at full scan speeds. No longer is it spectral or turbo flash. Turbo flash is spectral. And so it really offers the ability to provide meaningful answers uncompromised. This is the power of photon counting. This is the power of the Naatome Alpha. We believe photon counting will be combined with many different artificial intelligence tools, and it will be the one-stop shop for diagnostic workup and treatment planning, especially in cardiovascular imaging as we move forward into 2024 and beyond. To give you some real world experience, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Angela Kelly and Dr. Chuck Shepard from Children's Minnesota, who will show how cardiovascular CT with the Naatome Alpha is impacting their practice. Thank you, Matt. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Kelly, and I'm here with my colleague, Dr. Chuck Shepard. We're honored to present today on the real-world applications of photon counting CT for pediatric cardiovascular imaging. We are receiving an honorarium from Siemens for this talk. We otherwise have no additional disclosures. So as background into our practice, our pediatric CV surgical volume at Children's of Minnesota is over 450 cases a year, stemming from a robust fetal program with a large referral base. Our total advanced imaging volume is over 400 cases a year. It's typically been pretty evenly split between CT and MRI, though this year with the addition of the alpha scanner, our CT numbers have grown and we're well over 200 CTs already for 2023. Infants make up over or almost half of our CT volume. And that's primarily driven by our surgical practice and preferences. So all neonates with heterotaxy, most complex congenital heart disease babies, such as more complex double out the right ventricle, those with pulmonary atresia, truncus, they'll all get scanned pre-surgery. Our surgeons really like CT confirmation of coronary artery origins on all DTGA babies. And they also like pre-surgical scans on most arterial or venous anomalies, such as coarctation of the aorta, vascular ring, and pulmonary vein anomalies or stenosis. We do CTs for pre glen valves in most patients, as well as prior to complete repair of tetralogy in patients with prior VTT shunts. CTs are read in a partnership with pediatric radiology, with cardiac findings read by advanced imaging trained pediatric cardiologists and non-cardiac findings read by pediatric radiology. Our CT program was originally established and built by Dr. Kelly Hahn, who many of you know. Uh, she's essentially one of the pioneers of congenital cardiac CT imaging, and we owe the entire success of this program to her. She originally developed the program in partnership with our neighboring adult hospital, and up until the installation of the Alpha, we were using their CT scanner, which is a dual source Siemens force. Uh, while we actually loved sharing their facilities and expertise, it was quite a transport for our patients. It felt a little like over the river and through the woods, so it was, a, it was at least about 12 minutes each way. We were very fortunate to be the second children's hospital in the US to install the Alpha. And while this was a very welcome physical location change to have the scanner located in our children's hospital, it did come with some challenges. 
uh, we went from having CT techs who do multiple thousands of cardiac CTs every year to CT, tech, CT techs who, while pediatric trained, had not yet done a cardiac CT. And then with photon counting technology being so new, this was a learning curve for all of us regardless. Our alpha scanner was installed in September of 2022 with our first cardiac scan performed less than a month later. The age range we've scanned thus far has been from 12 hours to 25 years of life. And the smallest cardiac patient we've scanned was a 1.7 kilogram premature infant with severe coarctation. Admittedly, the learning curve for the scanner at first was both daunting as well as exciting. So our transition, as I mentioned, was complicated by our physical location change and all the new IT systems that came along with it. In terms of the scanner itself, it has a brand new user interface, including a timeline, which is really helpful as you're doing your scan. Photon counting technology improves your iodine contrast signal, and we'll show you some examples of that. Even going from one dual source scanner to another, as we did from the force to the alpha, there were small changes in scan delay and timing to account for. That was a very easy adjustment. And then we do a lot of functional scans in our program. So retrospective spiral scans with pulse dose ECG gating. The alpha set that such, such that outside of what you said is that pulse acquisition window, the remainder of the cardiac cycle is scanned at 10% dose. On the force, this was 15%. So primarily this change is excellent. Uh, obviously lower radiation dose is better, but there are a few situations such as neonatal coronary imaging or visualizing valve details throughout the cardiac cycle that may have you want to widen that acquisition window a little bit. And we'll talk about that as well. Our main questions though were simply, what mode do we want to use? Um, do we choose quantum mode where we can set our KVP to 70 or 90, or do we choose quantum plus where it's at 120 KVP, it's more modulated by the scanner and gives us the availability of all that spectral information that Matt talked about. And then for our functional scans, when do we use the quantum HD cardiac mode or the ultra high resolution mode at 0.2 millimeters? And then just which reconstruction kernels do we like? This one's really very subjective and we ended up typically using a slightly sharper kernel than we were using with our previous scanner. So in putting together with this talk, we really thought it would be most useful to you to see how we made some of these decisions. Uh, we can't say all of our answers are uh, right and we're constantly learning, tweaking things a little bit, but we also thought it'd be helpful to just see some of the comparisons we did on our initial cases and how we ended up where we are. We'll then look at some of the other interesting cases we've done along the year, and we'll finish up by talking about some potential future directions. So I'll start with the very first case we scanned on the alpha. This was a one day old 3.5 kilogram male with prenatally diagnosed detransposition of the great arteries, ventricular septal defect and coartation. We did two scan sequences on this patient. So one was a retrospective spiral functional scan in UHR mode at 120 kVp. It's 0.2 millimeters imaging resolution with an acquisition window of 220 to 240 milliseconds and covering the cardiac silhouette. So despite that this was a retrospective scan, it's very low dose, DLP is only 9.4. But as we go through the image, it's a bit grainy. So the left main coronary artery origin, uh, which we'll see is right there, normal for transposition. The right coronary artery origin I can say is probably normal, but I can't see it confidently. I can just tell you, I don't think there's a coronary where there's not supposed to be one. Uh, now note though that our IQ level here is set to 15. So this was an attempt at trying to translate our prior force protocols to the alpha, and that didn't really work out so well. We had to figure the alpha out on its own because it really is such new technology. So we also did a prospective high-pitched helical scan, a flash scan of the chest, which is there on the right, including the full lung fields. So this was a quantum scan set to 70 kVp, and here we set the IQ level to 64. So that was based on recommendations from another institution from their protocols on the alpha, and as you can see, that scan turned out just beautifully. Uh, we can see a normal left coronary artery origin. We can follow the right coronary artery origin this time. We can not only see the origin, but we can follow it into the AV groove. And look at the dose here. The DLP is only 2.8. So from our standpoint, that's just incredible. And this is a look at the coarctation of the aorta on that patient in both 2D and 3D reconstructions. We do 3D reconstructions in nearly all of our cases due to preference of our surgical program. Our surgeons really like this 3D visualization of aortic arch branching and anatomy as they plan their surgical approach. 
Now we'll move on to the second cardiac case down on our scanner. This is a 21-year-old male with history of bicuspid aortic valve with severe insufficiency. Today was post Ross procedure five months prior. He was very poorly compliant with his post-surgical activity restrictions, and he unfortunately presented with echo findings of graft dehiscence at the aortic annulus. So due to the concern for graft dehiscence, we wanted to see that region of, of interest throughout the cardiac cycle. So he also had two scans performed. The first was a functional scan covering the cardiac silhouette and proximal ascending aorta. This was done at 90 kVp with a 70 to 75% diastolic acquisition window, this time with an IQ level of 64, trying to learn from that last case. And then the second scan was a flash scan of the chest. This was done in quantum plus mode at 120 kVp, also at IQ level of 64. We tried out a few different reconstruction kernels as well. So I'm showing you a BB40 and a BB44 for comparison. Both of these scans honestly are gorgeous. Uh, they show you the graph dehiscence just below the aortic annulus at that right lateral aspect, the pseudoaneurysm formation. You can see the coronary arteries very well. Uh, the issue here is not the scan quality at all. It's that we looked at the radiation doses. And again, this is an adult patient, adult size. Um, overall, these doses are very good, but as you know, with our congenital heart disease patients, they have repeated scans, repeated radiation exposure. We really try to push, push these doses as low as we can. So the question we asked ourselves is, you know, these are beautiful images, but do we actually need them to be this beautiful? And then here's a short axis view of ventricular function. We often use our short axis stack from our functional data set to then trace ventricular volumes as we would for MRI. Our contrast bolus was intentionally timed in this case for the left heart. Uh, but that said, with the increased iodine signal on photon counting scans, it's sometimes tough to really window the 2D image appropriately to get all the detail you might want in the right heart. In this case, you know, we could easily have still traced volumes, but we do with patients with biventricular pathology time our contrast bolus a little differently, and I'll talk more about that. Now that said, you can also use this increased contrast signal to your advantage. When we look at that image on the right, our 3D reconstruction, we've actually windowed the right heart entirely out of that image to just look at those left heart structures. And we can really see the change in that pseudoaneurysm throughout the cardiac cycle. Again, just beautiful images. This next case is a three-day-old, 3.1 kilogram female with prenatally diagnosed Turner syndrome and coarctation. We were asked to define the arch anatomy for preoperative plan planning. This patient's free breathing with a heart rate of 184 beats per minute. So going to that temporal resolution Matt talked about. Here we have a direct comparison of a quantum scan at 70 kVp and uh, another quantum plus scan at 120 kVp. Both of these are, are in an IQ level of 44, both with the same reconstruction kernel. Um, to us, the quantum plus scan on the right is just a little bit nicer of a picture, though these are both just great images and they're both diagnostic. Uh, when we compare radiation doses, they're both low dose. Uh, this quantum plus DLP is 21.3, but then with the quantum, it's just 2.7, which is just incredibly low. And then here's a look at that coarctation of the aorta by 3D. Again, this is really what our surgeons just love to see. They love to see all the details of that branching pattern, the arch anatomy, as they plan their surgical approach. All right, so we'll now move on, you know, after making those comparisons to where we've landed at this point for some of our current protocols. So that increased iodine signal with photon counting allowed us to switch to a contrast media with a lower iodine concentration. So we went from Omnipake 350 to Optoray 320, which is also what our cath lab uses. We also increased our saline dilution percent. So typically with kids, we're injecting a mix of contrast diluted with normal saline. On the babies we looked at, that's often about a 50% mix. And since so many of our patients have biventricular pathology, we prolong our typical injection time. We've drawn out the bolus of it to have a more similar opacification of both ventricles for our 3D reconstructions. We give two cc's per kilo of contrast in most patients, uh, but others like such as those with Fontan or complex vascular anatomy, such as heterotaxy patients, get closer to three cc's per kilo in a split injection protocol. So a third of the contrast, a 30 second delay for venous opacification, the remainder of the contrast, and then our scan uh, proceeding is normal from there. 
the majority of our scans are those prospective high-pitched helical or flash scans to define the anatomy. Um, and we do the, again, ECG-gated retrospective spiral scans for function. So we primarily use that quantum mode at 70 kbp for pediatric patients and 90 for adults at that IQ level of 44. We do use the quantum plus mode in select patients where we really feel that spectral information will be helpful, such as those with metal artifacts. We'll show some examples of that or a lot of calcification. We use the quantum HD cardiac or the UHR mode for function also in select patients and particularly for neonatal coronary imaging. So talking a little bit more about those neonatal coronaries, we do use intubation and breath holds. These are pre-surgical patients and our surgeons have really come to rely on the detail of coronary anatomy that we can see in these scans. Uh, these are really uh, the only cases where we use a bit wider pulse acquisition window and we increase the IQ level to 60. On the other end of the spectrum for functional imaging, we also do a fair number of dynamic airway scans, typically for vascular ring, but occasionally for post-operative CHD patients. So these are done free breathing wherever possible. Uh, we use a very minimal acquisition window, decrease the field of view to just include the airways, and we can even decrease the IQ level to 35 typically since we're looking at large structures. All right, with that as background, we'll now share some more of the fun and interesting cases that we've done over the past year. This one's one of my personal favorites. This is a one day old 3.2 kilogram male with prenatally diagnosed arterial tortuosity syndrome. Echo findings were that of a left aortic arch with tortuosity of the distal transverse and proximal descending aorta, which was really kind of difficult to define by echo, as well as a large tortuous PDA. He was unsedated, bundled and scanned. And just to illustrate the efficiency of our scanner, our cardiac unit is on the fourth floor of our hospital, radiology is on the first floor. So even with a couple of elevator rides required for his transport, he was gone from his room for an entirety of only 15 minutes for his CT scan. So he had a flash scan using our usual parameters with a DLP of 2.7. And this arch really is best appreciated by 3D. So we can see that descending thoracic aorta with the curly Q pattern. We can also see the hypoplasia of his transverse aortic arch in that right image. And this is a left arch with an aberrant right subclavian artery as well as uh, marked distal displacement of the left subclavian. So both the subclavian arteries come off of that uh, distal tortuous aorta. Both subclavians are stenotic at their origins and tortuous themselves. So this scan was really important for helping us understand we really can't follow a blood pressure gradient clinically and we needed to take a different approach. Our next case is a 15-year-old male, history of double outlet right ventricle with pulmonary atresia, status post to 1.5 ventricle repair with a bidirectional glen and an RV to PA conduit, also with a history of post-op heart block, status post an epicardial dual chamber pacemaker. He presented with two weeks of fever, a blood culture at an outside facility positive for strep species, and an increased gradient across his pulmonary valve by echo. So findings consistent with prosthetic pulmonary valve endocarditis. We did do a functional UHR scan in him. We really wanted to see details of that valve throughout the cardiac cycle. And then also to note, since he is a 1.5 ventricle repair, uh, and since we really want that right heart to be bright, his right ventricle and his pulmonary valve, we did a lower extremity peripheral IV for contrast injection. So here we have very pretty, very detailed images of a very ugly prosthetic pulmonary valve endocarditis. We can also see the RV dilation, uh, poor function, regional abnormalities, and septal flattening. But again, this is just a very nice view of this valve. And then our next case is a four month old, 4.6 kilogram female with history of hypoplastic left heart syndrome with intact atrial septum and a decompressing vertical vein. She status post initial vertical vein stenting, followed by a Norwood procedure with sano conduit and an atrial septectomy. She did have intraoperative notes of a thickened atrial septum. She presented now with persistent cyanosis and echo demonstrating a restrictive atrial communication. She went to the cath lab, but they were unable to access her pulmonary veins. So this was one of those late afternoon phone calls where they say, you know, we have this patient in the cath lab. Have you heard about her? We can't get into her pulmonary veins. And you know, she's here, she's sedated. How about if we just bring her right down to the scanner? So of course we say yes. 
Uh, she too had a flash scan, again, very low dose, DLP of 3.8. And we can tell what the problem is. So uh, first off in this left 3D image, we can see that the pulmonary veins come to a confluence at the left atrium. And then as we follow the 2D image on the right, so this is gonna move from posterior to anterior. In this image, we can see our pulmonary venous confluence. As we move through that, there's the orifice to the left atrium. We come into the left atrium. And then now we can see there's a membrane there between the left and right atrium. So that's what's preventing them from getting in. And this scan correlated perfectly with the intraoperative findings on this patient. So our next patient is a history as a three week old with a history of detransposition of the great arteries with congenitally absent circumflex coronary artery, status post an arterial switch procedure with Lecomte. Uh, during their postoperative course, they were emergently placed on a VA ECMO for cardiopulmonary failure, developed ascites while on VA ECMO, had multiple attempts to come off ECMO without success, had recovery again of uh, biventricular function and was stented the morning of the scan. They wanted to scan this time, hoping they could really stay off ECMO, really take a good look at that SVC to RA flow and look for any streaming across a residual ASD. So we did a left upper extremity contrast injection in this case. Um, left chosen just because there was a line already in the right, uh, right upper extremity. Flash scan with our normal parameters, again, very low dose. And then here, taking a look at our 2D images, we can see in that image on the left, our venous and our arterial cannulas. So our venous cannula has a tip in the suprahepatic IVC, um, our arterial cannula in the right common carotid. But if we look at that venous cannula, we really don't see any flow in the SVC around that venous cannula. And we'll take a look at that in a couple more images here. So again, we really don't see SVC flow around that venous cannula. We can see in that, uh, especially in that 3D image, the dilation of the surrounding vessels. So we've got dilation of the rima there, the azagous, the hemiazagous systems are dilated. And then as we move here to the abdomen, we can see, oh, sorry, I went a little too far there. Uh, the IVC is actually brighter than the descending aorta in that image. So uh, left upper extremity contrast injection, our contrast is getting to the heart through the IVC. So we really have just occluded that SVC. And this scan was able to help us uh, decide how far back those cannulas needed to be pulled. And as those cannulas were pulled back, cardiac output improved. This patient was able to stay off of ECMO. The ascites began to resolve and patient began to do clinically much better. I'm not going to turn the talk over to my colleague, Dr. Chuck Shepard, who's going to go through some more interesting cases with you. I <clears throat> thank you to Matt and to Dr. Kelly. So I will try to continue on here with some of our interesting cases. Uh, what I want to just start off with, though, is just saying you know, sometimes you go to these talks and these are cherry picked cases, but the scanner really has been very consistent for us. Uh, so these are really some just normal examples of, of what the scanner has produced. Our next case is a 17 year old TGA, so transposition of the great arteries who underwent repair in infancy and then has had multiple re-interventions including multiple stents in the uh, bilateral branch pulmonary arteries and other uh, metal artifacts that made uh, cardiac MRI very challenging. And so a cardiac CT was requested for coronary artery evaluation as well as for uh, functional scan and evaluation of these branch pulmonary arteries that have been very challenging to see. So as we go through, we can see just beautiful definition and resolution of these stents uh, and and fine details just to help. And you see that distal main pulmonary artery narrowing, great details to help both the surgeons and our interventionalists plan for re-intervention. And this also just gave beautiful coronary artery imaging as well. The next case is a two day old with interrupted aortic arch. The, uh, the scan was requested due to both concerns of the aortic arch, our surgeons really like to know exactly what distance there is and which vessels go where, 
as far as their planning for the operative repair of the aortic arch, as well as uh, on this one, there was concern for dynamic left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. So for this scan, we did both a functional UHR as well as a flash scan. And this allowed for both intracardiac as well as the extracardiac uh, definition. DLP of 2.2 gives this beautiful image uh, from the flash scan. You can see that interrupted aortic arch. You can even see a tiny ligament coming from that distal arch heading towards the descending thoracic aorta. Uh, so this is just a beautiful example of that uh, interrupted aortic arch. And then for the intracardiac anatomy, I always love 2D best, but our surgeons really always want the three-dimensional imaging. So on the left image, we can see a ventricular septal defect uh, and how that is related. And then on the right image, we get a functional idea of that left ventricular outflow tract, which was more reassuring by CT. And we were able to proceed without needing a cono or other interventions in the child seem to do very well with that. Our next case is a three kilogram, four week old infant uh, who was noted to have left ventricular dysfunction. There was suspicion for L-kappa or anomalous origin of the left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery. Uh, however, it was very difficult to visualize by echocardiogram. This uh, study was requested urgently for preoperative evaluation of the coronary arteries. So again, we used a functional UHR scan. Uh, and with this, we had a DLP of 81.9, but we're able to show quite nicely in a very small infant, this anomalous uh, pulmonary origin of the left coronary artery. Uh, and so both in two dimensions, and then again for our surgeons in three dimension, just to be able to visualize that and prepare for surgery. And this really, again, helps with the preoperative planning. Our next child was a 16-year-old with SVT. So while uh, preparing for ablation for the SVC, had an echocardiogram that incidentally was concerning for anomalous aortic origin of the right coronary artery from the left aortic sinus. Uh, basically, the scan was requested for risk stratification. No sedation was used. We were able to use a little bit of beta blocker and uh, get a DLP of 60 and still get very beautiful images uh, that again, we can use for preoperative planning. You're able to see out distally these coronary arteries despite very low, very reasonable doses. The next case is a seven-year-old history of Kawasaki diagnosed at one year of age with giant coronary artery aneurysms. Unfortunately, this child had a delayed presentation and then initial refusal of, of treatment uh, by the family. And so we were unable to convince the family until seven years of age to get this advanced imaging. And so this is the first scan that we've had beyond echocardiography. Uh, there was no sedation as family refused. We gave a little bit of beta blocker and then again used a functional scan to take a look at these coronary arteries. And then you can see the calcification and complete occlusion of that right coronary artery, as well as additional aneurysms of the distal left main proximal LAD coronary arteries. And again, you just get great detail on these scans. And this actually was quite a fidgety little seven-year-old child uh, who did not do a great job of holding the breath. And yet these are very helpful images to understand what's going on with his uh, pathology. The next scan is a five month old. And as Dr. Kelly mentioned, we're often asked for dynamic evaluation of the airway and vascular rings and slings. Uh, so this was a prenatal diagnosis of double aortic arch. The uh, scan was requested to confirm anatomy as well as for dynamic airway evaluation. So very light sedation was used with free breathing. Uh, we used a simulated heart rate of 60 beats per minute uh, with a functional scan window uh, of with a pulse window of 260 to 260 milliseconds. And with that, we were able to keep the DLP down to 14.7 and yet still get 
very diagnostic images. Uh, on the playback, it's a little bit harder to see on the right image, but you just see coming in and out this compressed left main stem bronchus and beautiful, again, imaging for surgical planning of how to repair uh, this aortic arch, this double aortic arch. The next example we have is a two-day-old infant, 3.3 kilograms with a prenatal diagnosis of truncus arteriosus type 1. The echo also was concerning for a sinus venosus type ASD and partial anomalous pulmonary venous return. So the request for the study was, of course, to look at the truncus arteriosus and the branch pulmonary arteries, as well as this ASD and the partial anomalous pulmonary veins, as well as the coronary arteries. So they kind of wanted everything on this scan, and we intubated and sedated the child for this scan. We had a heart rate at the time of 181 beats per minute. And despite that, we're able to get very nice images. Uh, the functional scan, we had a DLP of 6.5. And yet on this, we're able to show uh, the right upper and right middle pulmonary veins entering into the superior vena cava along with the atrial septal defect, superior sinus venosus type atrial septal defect. So uh, we were also able to show coronary arteries and these branch pulmonary arteries arising from the truncus arteriosus with a short main pulmonary artery. So again, images just helpful in the preoperative planning and preparation for these surgeries. The next case I want to share is a seven-year-old with a prenatal diagnosis of hypoplastic left heart syndrome who had undergone a Fontan with multiple stents and coils, uh, much, much, uh, a whole lot of metallic artifact limiting the cardiac MRIs. So prior MRIs were quite limited due to all of the artifact. So this was requested for a cardiac CT to, to evaluate for right ventricular size and function, as well as the Fontan pathway and aortic arch. Uh, this was a child that wasn't felt to be able to cooperate with the scan, so the child was intubated and sedated, had a heart rate at time of scan of 80 beats per minute. And for this, we did use both a functional scan as well as a flash scan. Uh, the, the scans uh, produced beautiful detail of these image of these uh, pathways as well as uh, delineation of collateral vessels, uh, beautiful opacification of the Fontan pathway, again using that, uh, that delayed protocol with the 30, uh, 30 second pause, allowing for a split injection and just great opacification of all of these structures of interest. You can see the uh, stent in that proximal left pulmonary artery. And again, able to visualize that and give more detail as we're planning additional interventions on this child. The next case was a three-week-old 2.8 kilo infant. Uh, the echocardiogram, which uh, was obtained shortly after birth, was concerning for findings of left ventricular hypertrophy as well as possible coarctation. And of note on the echocardiogram, we notice that the main and brand, main pulmonary artery as well as the aorta was very echo bright and there was concern for calcification. So for this scan, we were specifically requested to look for calcification, which we don't often do in three week old infants, as well as look at the coronary arteries and for aortic coarctation. So this child was intubated and sedated for breath holds. Heart rate at time of scan was 105 beats per minute. And we used, again, both a flash scan and a functional scan. This time in reverse order, we did the functional scan prior to any contrast given. And this was pretty much a neck to thigh scan. And despite that, had a DLP of only 3.3 and beautiful images. And then the functional scan was able to nicely show the coronary arteries. And on this, you can see uh, just basically this is the whole body, but you notice some, uh, this is again, the pre-contrast flash scan, you notice some opacification throughout the body. And here we see calcification of some of the coronary arteries as well as uh, the aorta and the pulmonary artery. And then you also can see uh, the distal descending and 
abdominal aorta down to the bifurcation, as well as some highlighting of the of the kidneys. And so uh, this child had diffuse calcifications, uh, was diagnosed with hypercalcinosis, and was able to be started down the treatment pathway uh, and, and helped out with the scan. The next example is a 10-year-old with tricuspid valve regurgitation, uh, significant biocardiogram. The acoustic windows were very challenging. Um, and just basically this child was not felt to be able to be able to do a cardiac MRI without sedation, but they did feel that they could do a CT scan without sedation. So we had a heart rate of 65 beats per minute and did a, a functional scan uh, with a acquisition window of 280 to 350 milliseconds. And we were able to give additional detail to our surgeons as far as trying to evaluate uh, indications and preoperative planning to give right ventricular size and function, uh, as well as atrial sizes uh, to help decide whether this child needed surgery and how to uh, approach that surgery. The next case is a six-year-old with transposition of the great arteries. It was quite complex with dextrocardia, side-by-side -side great arteries, systemic veins to a posterior atrium, and uh, very interesting positioning of the ventricles. Uh, the child underwent a, a complex repair, including a LeCompte maneuver, and was suffering with chronic systolic heart failure. So post-arterial switch and LeCompte, there was a question of the coronary arteries. They wanted function. And they also wanted us to look at the sternum. There were concerns for sternal non-union. And so a functional scan was utilized with a pulse window acquisition window of 220 to 260 milliseconds. And we were able to have these beautiful images. Of note, we did also follow this with a flash scan. And so the first image is actually, the first and the third images are the functional scan. And then the third, the central image is the flash scan, but you see on the first image, you don't really see filling of that coronary artery that crosses anterior and is going to be a circumflex coronary artery. And then on the second image, you can actually see severe stenosis of that proximal circumflex coronary artery. So this again was very helpful in understanding and just look at regional wall motion abnormalities on the, on the functional scan and to see the coronary arteries and where the stenosis was as far as what do we, what do, we do next to help this child uh, in the future. The next case is a two-year-old 10 kilogram child with history of VSD, ASD, and left pulmonary vein repair. Uh, and so this scan was to evaluate after echo was concerning for pulmonary vein stenosis. A flash scan was utilized with the DLP of under seven. And here we were able to show very nicely that the left upper pulmonary vein was completely occluded with about a one centimeter gap out to the distal branches, as well as focal narrowing of that proximal uh, left lower pulmonary vein. Again, very helpful in pre-intervention planning. Next case is a 12-year-old with obstructed TAPVR, prenatally diagnosed, and within a few hours after birth was clinically de declining. Our surgeon really wanted to take a look by CT to know how to go in in the middle of the night. And so this was uh, in preparation for that. The child was intubated for clinical reasons. Heart rate was 109 beats per minute. And the DLP was only 4.7 on this. But we can see this uh, total anomalous pulmonary venous return with vertical vein to the hepatic venous drainage system. You see individual pulmonary veins, which help to know the location position. You can also see a persistent LSVC draining to a coronary sinus, which left a very small left atrium. All of this was exceptionally helpful for the surgeon to then actually reposition the atrial septum and to open up those pulmonary veins, connect them to the left atrium. So in conclusion, uh, what we love about this scanner, there is absolutely outstanding temporal and spatial resolution. And again, I will just say that this scanner is very consistent. This is not so much cherry picked images from our collection. This is very consistently this, this scanner performs at very low doses. We've been able to customize the protocols and we keep refining those. And again, we reach out to everybody to share your uh, your protocols 
and so that we can all get better at this and, and have even lower doses. It was a very friendly scanner to kids. The light colors change. We often ask kids what color they want. It's wide bore, it's very rapid, so that these kids are in and out in no time and uh, it's the least trauma possible. We do have a few thoughts on uh, future opportunities. Uh, we are hoping at some point we'll have the ability to adjust the pulse gating dose for the remainder of the cardiac cycle outside of the acquisition window. Uh, a lot of times that 10% is great, but oftentimes having just a little bit more might be helpful in certain situations without going to full dose. Also ability to set the computer simulated heart rates. And at this point, we probably aren't optimizing all of the alpha's capabilities. We do, do still do the majority of our scans at 70 or 90 kbp in these little, uh, in the little ones. Uh, but eventually we would like to use the quantum plus even more than we already are and fine tuning that in our center and other centers I think will be helpful so that we all can get full, the full capacity and capabilities of this amazing scanner. Uh, there is, as we've talked with other scanners who have started using this and getting their own alpha scanners, there is a lot of variability between programs. And uh, I think that there's a lot of need for user groups, focused workshops, additional research, and a lot of uh, community effort to optimize these machines and make them the best possible. And we just want to throw out a plug for SECT 2024. Uh, next July in Washington, D.C., and hope to see all of you there. And please, if there's any questions, we'll have a question and answer session next. And uh, please reach out to us with any questions or with any recommendations as we're still daily adjusting, making adjustments and making this better and better. All right. Thank you for your attention. All right. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Kelly and Dr. Shepard. Um, you know, wonderful cases, uh, really appreciate uh, you sharing that uh, with the audience. I have a few questions that came in the chat. We, we did answer a couple of them as they came through on the chat, but I think they uh, are, are worth uh, repeating for those who haven't been reading the chat um, in that process. So a few of the cases um, uh, talked about how you used a, a computer generated heart rate for some of the process, maybe you can explain how you use that to the audience. Sure, yeah, so <clears throat> basically with that, that's that's the demo mode. Uh, and so basically it's just a computer generated ECG. And so some of these kids, we know that uh, if we stop to put EKG leads on them, uh, we're going to lose them, so to speak. Uh, we also know that uh, with some of these cases specifically, we actually intentionally don't want the child's heart rate, which can often be very fast. For example, when we're trying to uh, do these dynamic airway types of studies, uh, they, uh, the heart rate can be often in the 120s to 150s. And so if we tried to follow the cardiac cycle, that would really limit and wouldn't actually give you a full respiratory cycle. So 60 gets us much closer. And that's where we say we would love to actually be able to have the, uh, the, cap the capability to further alter those and, and have more choices. Um, but that, that helps us to get closer to the respiratory cycle for these infants. And, and for the flash scans, some of these quick scans that we're just trying to get in and out, it's so rapid that we don't need to gate with their heart rate. Great. Uh, that's actually a practice I started probably, uh, I, I started doing that 12 years ago with the flash and then again with the force and it just seems to work very well. I don't know how others feel about it, but uh, it seems to work very well on some of these, especially the extra cardiac anatomy with the large structures. Um, just tagging on to the back of that question, as you're just saying, you're using flash mode. There was a question in the chat about um, the the some kind of definition flash that that someone uses does it have functional information in the flash mode on the alpha uh, the answer is no right it it is it is the same concept is that it's a single phase that it's acquired and um, you know in reality it's a certain portion in the R to R cycle when flash mode starts when it ends it's um, you know percentages later depending on the length moving at the seventy four centimeters per second the difference with 
the photon counting scanner is that it's also spectral. Um, so you can get iodine maps and iodine distribution, but not dynamic function. For that, you have to do a, a gated series. And most of the examples um, that Dr. Kelly and Shepard showed, uh, patients had both a, a retrospective function scan as well as a flash mode scan. There were cases with just one or the other as well. Yeah, there's certainly, you know, certainly flash still remains the workhorse of our program in the sense of patients who just need anatomic definition are just getting a flash scan. But we do have a lot of functional requests within our program, whether that's seeing, you know, dynamic outflow track, track changes, dynamic airways changes in, um, you know, shuns throughout the cardiac cycle. So we, we do coronary have arteries. coronary arteries. Yep. Um, there was a, another question about, um, has your um, approach to uh, sedation innovation changed? And, and I would say, obviously, you guys were scanning a lot of your cardiacs on the force before. So it's almost, what did you do before you had a dual source towards now where you are today, right, with, with, with the alpha? So our, our overall protocols haven't officially changed, but I would say our practice has changed. So... Um, we do, you know, some of the cases we showed were previously intubated for clinical reasons. Um, and then otherwise we do intubate and sedate our baby coronary evaluations like our detranspositions prior to scanning. And part of that is just that, you know, historically when looking at baby coronaries, we don't think of that as being a hundred percent yield type of evaluation as a CT, but really that's kind of where we're at right now. Um, and that's our surgeon's expectation is that they're really going to be able to see details of those coronaries. If there's an acute turn, something like that, they really want to see those details. And that's what the scanner has been delivering to us. Um, what else are they saying? Oh, but from a practical standpoint, what has changed is let's say uh, very recently, we had a four-year-old Fontan, very anxious child, you know, come in and she, she yelled at me, said she didn't want her picture <laughs> taken. We really, given her physiology and concerns, did not want to sedate her under any circumstances. Uh, we actually distracted her saying, oh, well, what's your favorite color? You know, I can change the colors on this scanner. Like literally that helped. And she ran through and had a gorgeous unsedated scan. So I don't know that that would have been possible with another scanner that just wasn't able to do things quite so quickly. So. Thank you for that. Um, uh, Joseph was asking a question for the functional RV case, 10 year old, uh, he thinks it was, the pulsing was set to 280 to 350 milliseconds, but the images look high resolution throughout the cardiac cycle. How do you choose the pulsing window and why don't the images outside of the window look more grainy? So I'd say that's a wider window than we typically use. So usually we're, we're sticking to about, you know, 20 milliseconds for a lot of functional scans, um, really no window at all for functional airway scans, but often it's times it's, you know, 20 to 30 milliseconds. So that's already wider than we usually use, which was probably for purposes of seeing the valve. Um, and then I would just say with, with that scan in particular, when you do slow it down and go frame by frame, it, it, you can see the difference. You can see the graininess yeah. outside of the acquisition window. Uh, there again, that's something where we are hopeful in the future to have a little bit more control over that aspect mm -hmm. of the uh, not out, outside of the acquisition window to be able to adjust that, um, you know, again, with the force having, I think it was 25% uh, dose compared to now 10% dose. So again, though, you get beautiful crisp images, even with the 10%, but there are times where it would be nice to have just a little bit more. Yeah, it was the balance between how many people used 4%, which was the min dose on a, on a force and, and got static versus people who got 25 simplified to 10%. To but no, certainly, um, you know, the possibility to adjust that would be uh, a, a feature that I, I'm sure people would would, would like to use. Um, do you do any 3D printing uh, for your surgeons or interventionalists? Um, does it help? Obviously you have beautiful uh, 3D VRTs as you've shown. Um, do you print at, uh, at Children's? We do and we kind of have yeah. two separate programs. So we have kind of a more basic 3D printer within our hospital that's more used for kind of the patient experience, like printing out the interrupted arch or coarctation to give to a patient and family. So they have a replica of their child's heart on a patient who got a scan. Um, in terms of more complex scans, 
We actually don't have the program to do that in-house. We've sent those out to other companies for, um, for printing, but that's certainly been done with our alpha images and they turn out beautifully. It's really the, the fairly rare case that our surgeons want that because they find the 3D virtual reconstructions to be fantastic. Um, and we've also worked kind of on a research basis with one of our surgeons in a local university to do um, more of like a virtual reality type 3D cardiac walkthrough with some of the images as well. And they found that really helpful. Plus it's really fun to watch people stand up with the 3D glasses and move around, so. Yes, I'd love to be able to walk through my own heart. I guess I gotta go get scanned <laughs> so I can I can take a tour. Um, um, uh, there was a question um, on, on, on what is the price of the scanner? Uh, the price- That one's uh, for you, Matt. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, so I have three of them in my garage. We can talk, you know. Um, what, the price all depends on where you're located and, and, and how it's configured. If you uh, send uh, us your email uh, or send it to me in a private message, I'm, I'm happy to connect you with your local salesperson so that uh, we, can, we can put a quote together. Uh, but I think uh, what you get is is worth the value, right? I mean, the, the images uh, on my screen, at least, uh, were were beautiful, um, and uh, I think uh, some of these three D VRTs that they showed, uh, I encourage them to submit to the uh, JCCT uh, Image Award because I mean, some of them are just amazing of what you can do. Um, we are just at time, so uh, again, I wanted to say thank you very much for everyone for joining. Um, uh, really a wonderful webinar. Dr. Kelly, Dr. Shepard, thank you so much for sharing your experience. Uh, we will post the recording with the full high resolution version online. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out uh, to, to, to any of us. Um, uh, find me on LinkedIn and, and, and ask me questions. So thank you very much for joining. Uh, appreciate it, everyone. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. so much for having us.